This is my first QS meeting, my first QS presentation, my first Ignite talk, and my first time in Mountain View and Google. So thank you for having me, and thank you, Raj, for the invitation. Um, so the idea for this presentation came last December when my sister and I went for our annual checkup. As you can see, I am um, I have an identical twin, and uh, as we're sitting there. I just decided to once and for all answer a question that has been bugging me for a while, which is that um, I was intrigued by the fact that my sister and I share the same genome, but yet we spent most of the past 17 years 40 pounds apart. So how is it possible that two people that share the same genome have such a different phenotype? And then so I must say this was not uh, an intentional experiment, so we didn't go uh, prospectively and start uh, uh, measuring things, but then we did go back and I say, let's look back all of our medical history and see if we can find clues about it. And as we move forward, I wanted to pay attention to one year. So that year is 1995 when my sister and I, for the first time in our lives, went on to live on different houses and adopted different diets. So that was the year my sister became a lawyer and she went on to the workforce and she started eating out uh, almost every day and I moved to Germany for a semester and I became vegetarian. So this is a timeline <laughs> that uh, pretty much tells all the dietary changes I made but it, it started very simple, just stopping watching TV, stop biting my nails and then uh, eventually I stopped eating other things too. So, but the first two ch uh, changes we did uh, make together, which was we both stopped drinking soda and eating red meat at the same time. But as I said, in 1995, when I uh, moved to Germany, then I said, since now I don't have to eat my mom's food anymore, I'm going to be vegetarian. I, my sister went on to continue to eat chicken and fish. Then another 30, 13 years went by, and uh, not much changed in our diet except that whatever changes occurred in the past. And in, in 2008, then, I went vegan. I don't like this word because <laughs> veganism is something that goes beyond what I do, but I did stop dairy, eggs, and gluten. And three years later, which is last year, I decided to eliminate all your sugar and caffeine. And the reasons for all these eliminations can be discussed in the Q&A or after the talk. But that's basically the baseline, and that's what is the difference. So um, the first result I'm going to be presenting is what we got by using the app Lose It that most of you probably know. And I started using in 2008 when I went vegan, even though I don't like the word. Um, and I, and that the reason is because everybody was bugging me about you not having enough protein, you not having enough protein. So I started tracking it. And a year later, my sister joined me. And for five weeks, we tracked everything we ate every single day together. And you cannot see what we eat, but believe me when I say it's pretty much the same uh, type of food, uh, same types of vegetables in amount, except for two things. My sister was still eating <coughs> fish and some egg whites. And I was eating massive amounts of nuts, which I don't do anymore. But when you first convert, to veganism, that's what you do because you think you need the protein and you need all the source. So, what you see in the next next slide is that uh, I think it's a green line. Our protein intake was pretty much the same, but our fat intake, which is the other line, I believe is the blue, uh, was very different. So, my sister managed to lose twice as many pounds in the same amount of time while I have 70% of her calories come from starch, and we believe that is because I was eating three times more fat than she is. But the first lesson that we learned, which is what I wanted to learn, is that plant-based diets may be high in protein, and that's what my way of showing the whole family seed. Uh, we have different diets, but we still eat the same amount of protein. And again, I don't even think we all need 20% of protein, but that's what we ate. Uh, the second lesson we learned is that focusing on the type of food we eat is a lot more important than counting calories. And that's what my sister spent most of her time or the past 17 years trying to do is counting calories to lose weight. So 500 calories from vegetables are a, a, a whole lot different than 500 calories from sugary foods and fried foods, so on and so forth. The third lesson we learn is something that everybody knows but we don't like to admit is healthy fats are fats and they contribute to weight gain and they slow our weight loss. And I was at a point that I didn't need to lose weight so it was okay, but that was the point. So the next few slides are gonna show something else that we did. So we went back to 1995 when we split our environment and our lifestyle and we noticed that we did start with the exact same weight. 
and in a matter of uh, two years then a uh, weight difference went up to be 22 pounds and another five years was 50 pounds different and you see that my sister did manage to lose weight four times but three times before uh, her weight loss was temporary and as soon as she um, ended her diet then her weight went back. That is not as soon, sometimes she was able to keep the weight a little lower for a couple years. But you see, so those are all the attempts. So the first one was Weight Watchers, then it was Weight Watchers, and protein shakes, then fasting. Then the last one is the one that was the most dramatic, and believe it or not, is the, the one time that she started mimicking my own diet. That's when she eliminated oils and sugar, and she didn't eliminate fish, but she eliminated gluten and something else that I won't remember. But that's when she, her weight got the closest to where I am. So the fourth lesson is one <coughs> lesson that most of us don't want to learn. It's diets really don't work, but lifestyle change does. So every time my sister was counting calories, and as soon as she finished a diet, she went back to eating what the way she ate, she gained weight until the time that she decided to make changes that would be for a lifetime. Then we decided to look into the two periods of time when her weight drop was the highest. The difference between these two periods is the first one was when she was counting calories, so it was the amount of food, not the type of food. And the second one, she changed the type of food she was eating, but not the amount. And you're gonna see, and we did some overlay, so when you see our, uh, our total cholesterol, we see that in the first period when she was just concerned about the amount of food, but not the type of food, <coughs> that her, to her total cholesterol actually went up. And in the second period of time when she changed what she was eating, then cholesterol started going down and she was still losing weight. With glucose, it was a very interesting uh, result we got. Not only did my, uh, her numbers didn't change that much, but they were very close to mine, which shows that glucose is very tightly genetically regulated and the body will do extra work to keep that range in uh, normality. But here came insulin, and that was the most fascinating of the three uh, biomarks that we paid attention. You see that as her weight was high, so was the la were the levels of insulin, and as her weight went down, her insulin levels went down to the lowest point when her weight was the lowest, which was about 2010, and her number was 4.4, was very close to my actual now 3.7. So. It comes to show us, and that's a big lesson, is that most of us pay a lot of attention to measuring glucose, and uh, ex except for type 1 diabetics, they cannot measure insulin. Insulin seems to be a much better marker because it's really showing how hard our metabolism has to work to keep that glucose under normality. So, and I have to do a disclaimer here. This is a stock photo. My sister's not that overweight, and I'm not that skinny. So, and she wanted me to clarify that before. So, so, when it comes to complex traits, we can see that genes do play a role, but environment is the major player. So, as a recap of the, my presentation, uh, number one is that plants are a good source of protein and we can have enough protein by adopting a plant-based diet. Focusing on the type of food we eat is a lot more important than counting calories and paying attention to calories. And uh, healthy fats will contribute to weight gain no matter how hard we want to believe otherwise. Um, lifestyle changes will be most beneficial and more likely to work than adopting any fat diet. Uh, insulin seems to be a better marker for how our metabolism is doing than glucose and environment when it comes to complex traits such as weight uh, matter more than genetics. And um, I had to convince my sister for 15 minutes last night to use this picture and I said, you look gorgeous, everybody's gonna just say, I'm skinny and you look beautiful. <laughs> so, but this is us last December and we're just fascinated by this data and we decided to now do our quantification with intent. So we're gonna put her back in the protocol that work when she lost 40 pounds and we're gonna measure everything we can. So thank you so much for your attention and I'm open to any questions you may have. Yeah, really interesting presentation. On, on your slide that showed the, um, the insulin changes, um, it looked like your insulin levels yes. varied quite a bit as well. Yeah. And, and to what do you attribute that? That, see, that period of time, I didn't have my weight 
And so I just cannot compare. So I and had I measured it with intent, I wish I would have repeated to see if it was really that high because all the other numbers really correlated well with the weight, except for that one time point was is ten. It could be that for some reason it was before the up oils and all of these things that for some reason it was going up because I was in a trajectory that I would be start to going to gain weight. But then for some, some reason, because I couldn't track, then it just went back. And the last time we measured it was 3.7. My sister would, did a better job in keeping her records than me. And, and have, you, have you seen insulin as a marker in other literature as well? Or do you think this yes. is I did. I did uh, when, um, so Mark Hyman, for instance, is an MD that he checks all his patients by insulin. He said two, three patients can have glucose levels. They are very normal. When you see insulin, you see this spike, and they say, this, is this patient is insulin resistant, and you just cannot catch just by measuring glucose. Okay. Uh, uh, I hope it, I'm not offensive, but I, the scientist in me would want to know that, have you verified that you actually are identical twins? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we have not. That's a very good question. <laughs> But we will certainly do that now. <laughs> Alicia? Yeah, I was gonna, I'm an identical twin as well, and so I had that exact same question. I'm like, are you sure that you're identical? How many minutes apart are you guys? Um, 15. Uh, and um, have you, have either of you had children? No. Okay. Karen? Yes, we did that very, because this was a retrospective study, so it was non-intentional, so, but we started noticing a lot of things on my sister um, for the past, I think, two years has been very anxious, and I said, uh, have you tried giving up caffeine? And both of us hate coffee, so it's not a problem. My sister absolutely adores chocolate. <coughs> I used to like it too, so but then I noticed that it was not good in my stomach, so I decided to stop. So the last time that she had just really uh, bad episode of anxiety, then she called me in a shay and very ang and told me I'm very anxious today. And I say, you know what? I've been experiment myself because that's what I did. I went off caffeine or chocolate for two months, and then I had like two pieces of chocolate and it was raw, very um, strong one. And I felt that I was anxious and I said, my gosh, I'm the most uh, calmest person I know and I'm anxious and I was having trouble sleeping. And then when she called me to tell me that and I said, did you eat chocolate today? And then she was really upset because she was supposed to be on a diet and said, yes, I did. And I said, yeah, I could tell because I've noticed that this past week that every time I ate chocolate, I felt more anxious, so stop right now and don't eat again. So, but then, uh, and also different amounts of sugar. Sure, there's a link there. It's just that we didn't measure. Did you say louder, please? Have you any other pairs of twins? No, this was just uh, last December, just for fun. And I say, you know what? We have to learn from the 17 years. And we, sh we should do something about it. And then right now when we start talking, especially where I work at UC Davis, and they have the way of measuring everything. And be, everybody wants to measure us, and they want to put in, uh, <laughs> kind of uh, <laughs> wearable devices. And I say, let's do it. And we're going to measure everything while she's on the diet. And I already told her, come and we'll do it. Steve? Um, did either of you, at any point during this uh, experiment, use coconut oil as a vegetarian fat? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. Did you have any weight loss during that period of time? I was just adding because it was the, the oil I would use to bake. Um, but I, I cannot answer that question. It was just because whenever I baked, that was the oil I was using. But that's all I know. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what drove some of your dietary changes, and then also you talk about anxiety. Did you notice any other cognitive changes, improvement, or otherwise with dietary changes? For the two of us, well, um, well, more specifically for you, as you as you started uh, to take more and more things out. Of your oh yeah, big changes. 
So um, I decided to become vegetarian just for ethical reasons, and uh, I don't know if this is the right word to use. And then I happened to have attended, uh, gone to a vet school, and then um, so when I start seeing animals being cute, I say I can't do that. And then I, that's why I decided to work with their cattle, and then. After I started doing more research on cancer and leukemia and start working on nutrition genomics, then I say there's no reason for us to be eating baby food at age 35. There's a reason why the mothers produce milk for a certain period of time. There's no reason for me to continue to eat other babies' food from their mothers, so that's why I decided to stop. And then the gluten, I noticed that it was just out of the blue that I noticed that I, for my whole life, I had trouble digesting and I never really paid attention because I think my system was a little cleaner. It was boom, I would eat in five minutes, I would be bloated and I say gluten needs to go out. But I can say that our body has this ability to try to cope with everything because my sister, is, she's off gluten, she does a lot better and then she goes back and then for the first week she suffers and then she goes back. So we'll function but at not at the optimal rate. And then all your sugar and caffeine you can discuss later, so because uh, we have another presenter, right? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Roseanne. Uh,